education is the point at which we decide we love the world enough to take responsibility for it. So when I first read those lines many years ago as an undergraduate, it was almost enough uh, to make me kind of quit my philosophy studies and go and rejoin the university as a teacher trainee, such an impact they had on me. Now, I mean, thankfully for a generation of young people, I decided to stick to my studies in philosophy and they were spared me in the classroom, but the words have been ringing in my ears ever since. Um, they capture, I think, something fundamental about the educational enterprise, um, and along with the rest of that essay, they, I think, provide a very helpful vantage point from which to understand the problems facing education in the West. Now, if this crisis in education was obvious enough to Arendt to deem writing about it back in 1954, I think even she would have been surprised by the magnitude of the crisis facing us today. The outlines of that crisis, I think, are kind of familiar enough to anybody who's uh, looked at education, the incredible decline in educational standards. Um, Arendt was an exceptional pupil, by the way, but nonetheless, the fact that she was fluent in Greek and by, the, by her early teens and could uh, read off realms of poetry and all the rest of it, but even that just seems like something from another planet to us uh, today. So the first part of, the, of the, the problem, this incredible decline in educational standards. The other thing we probably recognize is the relentless instrumentalization of education. It's education is now used, as Frank outlined, to serve ends very external to education. It's about making good citizens, making people aware of their genders, making people kind of anti-racist and all the rest of it. Uh, the other thing we probably notice is the collapse of the authority of the teacher. Um, and we'd also note, I think, the invasion of education by the imperatives of indoctrination. But the thing that Aaron identified, which really underlines all of the other issues, um, is that we, and this isn't just restricted to the teaching profession, but we in society have given up on taking responsibility for the world. Um, I'll explain what this means, but to kind of give you a measure of how much adults have given up taking responsibility for the world, we can examine an example which I think is kind of quite familiar to many of us, and I almost feel the need to apologize for using it because it's kind of, it's kind of like red rag to a bull uh, in conservative circles, but I choose it because it sums up really nicely the complete abdication of responsibility uh, and also the kind of giving up of authority these two themes, responsibility and authority, being related to each other uh, like two sides of the same coin. So the example I'm going to use, and again, I apologize for the tired and slightly worn example, but I'm, of course, going to invoke Greta Thunberg. Um, Greta, like some, uh, some kind of like Latter-day priest or something, is drawn onto the public stage to shame and humiliate adults. She's basically says, you, the adults, have messed everything up. We, uh, what we were entitled to, you've kind of destroyed and thrown away, and you've stolen our future, being the, the key phrase. Um, and now it's not particularly Greta that uh, I, I dislike, as annoying as she is, but the kind of key thing to understand is why Greta and the kind of Greta Thunberg phenomena has resonance far beyond uh, a kind of an appearance at Davos or all the rest of it. The question we have to ask is, why was Greta Thunberg invited, encouraged into her role? Um, so it's not just her parents, but like adult society as such greedily lapped up all of her admonishments. Um, and my point is that Greta reveals the degree to which adults have given up trying to take responsibility for the world. So it's the adults that screwed everything up. Um, and it's now the job of the adults to just sit down and listen to the children, um, who people never tire of telling us are, of course, the future. Um, now, whatever the problems of our era, and I mean, I would disagree that the main problems of our time are environmental ones, but the common assumption is whatever the problems are, they're the fault, but not the responsibility, the fault of the adults. And adults need to simply kind of move over and let someone else much younger to fix the mess. This then is the problem writ large in classrooms across the Western world, although to differing degrees. The underlying assumption of every civics class, what was called in my school uh, personal and social education, but something has found, has found its way into fields as diverse as biology, history, uh, literature, or geography. The assumption is we are educating a new generation to fix society's problems. 
So society is racist, so children have to be educated to be anti-racist. Society is sexist, so children have to be educated to be good feminists. Society is intolerant of gay and transgender people, so children are educated to explore their sexuality. Um, and of course, society is destroying the planet, so children have to be educated to find a balance with nature. Now, I mean, we could speak even at length about how just in doing this, we crowd out all of the space uh, for anything substantive in the curriculum. There's only so much time in the educational day and every lesson about a brave transgender person is one fewer lesson about Latin. But the thing I want to kind of hammer home is that this attitude has really surrendered what's vital to and perhaps even liberating about education as it should be understood. Education is the point at which we decide we love the world enough to take responsibility to it. And why is education so central, uh, sorry, why is responsibility so central to the educational enterprise? What does it mean to take responsibility for the world? What does it look like for a teacher faced with a classroom full of students? Um, now, I, I promise to answer these questions, but we need to take a little step back to understand what's really going on in education, kind of philosophically speaking. Um, one of the fundamental structural components of education that Arendt so well identified was that it involves preparing young people for a world which is not of their making. Children are born into a world which is inconceivably older than them. Um, like visiting a foreign country, one of the signal experiences of growing up is someone saying to you, this is how we do things here. So the kind of substance and independence of the world, the fact that it's much bigger than any child, this immediately gives rise to the need to both protect the child from the world, which is bigger and might overwhelm them, but also to introduce them to it. Um, the fact that the child would, as it were, be kind of broken in contact with the world lies not just in the fact that they're small or they lack basic skills, uh, but the fact that the world is made up of all of the accumulated things of history and contact with that would simply overwhelm the child, unless they were slowly and carefully and subtly introduced to it. And it's interesting, I think, that kind of being overwhelmed, being shattered in contact with reality, I mean, these are the kind of things that actually young people actually do complain of at the moment. Um, young people who are socialized in an educational system, which as I say, has given up taking responsibility for the world, they kind of, this is the one thing they complain of. They complain of being overwhelmed by the world. They, they, you hear young people all the time say it's all too much or variations like that. Um, so anyway, by, by virtue of the fact that the world proceeds and will outlast children, education needs to function both as a protection from the world, but also as a preparation for it. Now this preparation for the world um, consists predominantly in teaching young people about the world, about how it's worked, um, what it consists of, how it was built, and above all, why it is the way it is. And why, this is of course the fundamental question that the child asks, why, 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 why? Um, and it's, I think, really important for us to understand that the child is left, as it were, kind of short-changed if we answer this why question of the child by simply kind of passing the buck or passing uh, responsibility or giving someone else the kind of task of answering it. Uh, exhausted, exasperated parents might occasionally say, well, if you don't do what, as I say, then the police will come and they'll, they'll take you away. Um, but really, kind of what, what's going on there is when the parent abdicates responsibility. They've kind of give, they're, they're tired, they've had enough, they give up, and so it's like they kind of move over responsibility to someone else. Um, and there are lots of other kind of analogous examples. A child might complain, well, why must we go to school? And you might kind of exasperate it. They say, well, the government says so. Um, they might say, why is this person living on the street? And you might say, oh, well, evil people have kind of hoarded all the money. You might say, a, government, a child, as they get a bit older, they might start saying, oh, well, why do the government not listen to the people? Why are there all these protests, things like that? And you might just answer, oh, the government's corrupt, kind of forget about it. Um, but all of these are kind of examples of when adults refuse to accept uh, responsibility for these things and in doing so give up the authority that's central to educating and bringing up young people. So better answers to those questions might be, well, why must I go to school? Because I, your parent, I want to see you flourish. Um, why is that person on the street? Because our society doesn't care for them. Why doesn't the government 
uh, listen to the people, the wise, the government corrupt, because we, the people, keep voting in bad leaders, right? Those are better kinds of answers. I mean, what all this has to do with education is that the, when we give over our children to teachers, we kind of uh, give them on a trust that the teachers will carry on that, that uh, process of taking responsibility for the world. So to quote Arendt, the teacher's qualification consists in knowing about the world and being able to instruct others about it. But his authority rests on his assumption of responsibility for the world. Vis-a-vis -vis the child, it is though the teacher were a uh, representative of all adult inhabitants, pointing out the details and saying to the child, this is our world. There's a lot packed into those uh, beautiful lines, and the key idea, I think, is this phrase that the teacher is a kind of representative of all adult inhabitants. The teacher stands before the child as kind of like an ambassador on behalf of the world, ready to, um, on the basis of the teacher's knowledge, ready to answer the child's questions and instruct them on how things work. But crucially, the substance of his authority, the reason that he should be listened to after all the teacher, is the fact that he takes responsibility for, he insists on the value of the things that they teach. So unless the teacher believes Shakespeare is something vital to say about being human, their knowledge of dramatic irony or meter or symbolism, all of that's kind of unconvincing and probably, uh, probably useless as far as the child is concerned. The literature teacher in this case then takes responsibility for the value of Shakespeare or Goethe or Moliere, and more broadly for the world of human life that these authors represent. So today we see in the kind of repudiation of the canon the assumption that uh, there's something probably actually shameful uh, about Shakespeare or Locke or any of the other great authors. That both renders any actual learning about the canon very unlikely, because who, after all, is going to be particularly motivated by a teacher that kind of mumbles as they're introducing Shakespeare? Well, I'm kind of sorry, guys, we didn't have any time to do any women authors uh, this semester. I'm kind of sorry, blah, 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 blah. Um, but it also robs the child uh, of learning about the key elements that comprise our world. I mean, after all, we live in Shakespeare's world, and not teaching Shakespeare or any other the kind of key figures uh, literary or otherwise of our world, not teaching them makes the world less comprehensible to young people. So without taking responsibility for the world as it actually is, children are left without, as it were, any guideposts uh, in a world that, as I said, is not of their making. So unless we transmit the knowledge of our society, children are faced uh, with a world that's incomprehensible to them. So the task of education on this account is very, very clear. We take responsibility for the world as it is, and not, or at least not yet, to try and discuss how the world uh, should or ought to be. We might think of this as the kind of motto of education, first master the world as it really is. So to quote Aaron again, educators stand in relation to the young as representatives of a world for which they must assume responsibility, even though they themselves did not make it, and even though they may secretly or openly wish it were other than it is. Anyone who refuses to assume joint responsibility for the world should not have children and must not be allowed to take part in educating for them. So anyone who refuses to assume joint responsibility for the world should not have children and should not take part in educating them. What teachers are effectively, as it were, kind of in the position of saying to young people reminds me a little bit of something you hear about the kind of history of art that, say, at least people might complain about modern art, say it's all kind of rubbish and whatever, but they might concede that at least when the initial kind of avant-garde artists turned their back on beauty and started, say, dragging urinals into, the, uh, into galleries and stuff, at least they had kind of mastered the history of art. At least they kind of knew what it was that they were critiquing. Um, at least they had this kind of solid education and underpinning in, in the tradition that they then wished to attack. And the kind of situation in education is, I think, quite similar. Um, so in other words, first accept the world as it is, or at least learn about it, become fluent in it, um, and only on that basis might you change it. Note that it's also no contradiction to say that you think the world actually should be different than it is, but you, you, the adult, have a responsibility for the way it is now. 
Um, in a way, this is a classically kind of adult political attitude. You might think of some kind of stereotypical political speech where the agitator says, for too long, my comrades, we've allowed the ruling class to get away with it all, and now's the time. Now the time is when we say uh, enough, we have to change. And even in that kind of slightly hackneyed example, you see this kind of they're saying, we've let them get away with it, right? So it's us who's, who's done it. We're not palming off responsibility to someone else. I mean, in, in, any, in, in other words, kind of we've participated in this world, and now it's up to, to us to change it. At any rate, putting those examples aside, the key demand that we have to make of teachers then is to take responsibility for the world so that they may pass it on to children who are newcomers into it. And if we do not, we don't take responsibility for the world. We leave the child utterly unprepared to deal with the world that they were born into. I repeat it again, the abdication of responsibility is one of the, if not the, most important elements of contemporary education. The ruling ideas of teaching now basically assume that the job of, teach of teachers is to tell children, instruct them in how to remake the world, not to understand it. And in doing this, adults have cast off any responsibility, uh, uh, any responsibility for the world as it is now, and instead try to kind of use the children marionette fashion to remake the world as they think it should be. This is education fundamentally transformed into political training. Again, I quote Arendt, authority has been discarded by adults, and this can mean only one thing, that the adults refuse to assume responsibility for the world into which they have brought the children. Now, I mean, the highly perverse thing about this state of affairs, if I'm right that the kind of key fact about contemporary education is that adults no longer take responsibility for passing on the world to children, the really perverse thing about this state of affairs is that this transformation actually leaves young people completely incapable of doing anything new with, and doing anything new or interesting into the world that they were born into. The other side of the coin of the fact that the child needs protecting from the world and guidance about it is the truth that the world also, as it were, needs protecting from the child. As Arendt understands uh, the child, children represent something new. They represent something unique, something that's not been seen before. The birth of young people literally renews the world. It fills it with new things. Um, but the reason why contemporary education methods have this curious effect of leaving young people kind of less prepared than ever before to make good on the promise of their birth is that they don't prepare children to do anything. Again, I reflect on the fact that generations who have grown up with this content-free education system, one that transmits them no knowledge, um, and a society where, as I've said, adults abdicate their responsibility, um, it's one, this world is where young people kind of seem to complain that they're almost floating around in, in thin air. Young people find themselves entering a world as if there were no ground between their feet. Their education system has given them nothing of substance on which to stand. They, to a degree that I think well exceeds any kind of natural rebelliousness or alienation that young people might feel, young people today really feel that the world is not their own. Um, and so young people come into the world with a curious mix of hyper-politicization and complete indifference. They're both more concerned than ever before about changing the world, but also less involved in it. They feel with the kind of burning intensity all of the problems of the world, and yet feel completely unable to do anything about it. They're full of political demands, yet beset by listlessness and mental health problems. They're more critical of their parents' generation, and yet on everything from financial independence to living at home, they're more dependent than ever on their parents. Um, they blame their parents for everything, yet, as I said, never move out from home. So the irony of an education system which is increasingly geared to political ends, that is, education redesigned as a project of social engineering, is that it leaves young people completely unprepared to make their own mark on the world. Educators then kind of need to hold in their mind a situation which at first seems contra contradictory but is really completely rational, namely that the best way to ensure the renewal of the world 
is to ensure that education sticks to essentially conservative principles. Arendt says, and I'll apologize here for a, a long quote, but this is my one time where I've got a captive audience to talk about Hannah Arendt, so I don't really apologize. But um, as Arendt says, we're always educating for a world that is or is becoming out of joint. For this is the basic human situation in which the world is created by mortals. Because the world is created by mortals, it wears out. And because it constantly changes its inhabitants, it runs the risk of becoming just as mortal as they are. This means that the world has to be constantly set right anew. The problem is simply to educate in such a way that setting the world right again remains possible, even though it can never be assured. Our hope always hangs on the new that every generation brings, but precisely because we can only hope on this, we destroy everything if we try to control the new so that we, the old, can dictate how it will look. Exactly for the sake of what is revolutionary and new in every child, education must be conservative. It must preserve this newness and introduce it as a new thing into an old world. I mean, there's much else we could reflect on in this essay of Arendt's. Um, over the day, I think we'll have time to consider how uh, some of her thoughts on how education loses its purpose as it turns into training, as Frank was saying, um, her identification of how the crisis of education is related to the kind of closing divide between the public and the private, uh, her considerations on how one of the damaging assumptions that pins modern, underpins modern education is that, there's, that adults and children are kind of separated off in two distinct worlds and that therefore no contact between them is possible. And of course, her thoughts on how the crisis of education is related to the more general crisis of authority. I do have to, I think, end and add a few reflections on this last point on the relationship between authority and education because I've kind of insisted in this essay that education is a, in this lecture, that education is an authoritative enterprise and that the authority of the teacher lies in their taking responsibility for the world. But Aaron insists that this taking responsibility for the world is kind of difficult today because the modern world is structured, after all, by a semi-conscious revolt against all forms of authority. And this revolt is so far-reaching that it's even infected kind of pre-political areas like the education system. In other words, we have a kind of general problem that there's very little plausibility today for those who claim authority, and especially for those who claim authority on the basis of a tradition. And this leaves us in a very special situation because kind of against traditional conservatives who just want to turn the clock back or kind of progressives uh, or centrists, uh, progressives who wish to plow ahead and centrists who kind of wish, uh, hope that the general crisis of authority will not kind of overtake their special area. Um, Arendt really understands, I think, the full depth of the problem that we're faced with. She says, Whatever the crisis, wherever the crisis of authority has occurred in the modern world, one cannot simply go on nor yet simply turn back. The prob problem of education in the modern world lies in the fact that by its very nature, it cannot forgo either authority or tradition. And yet it must proceed in a world that's neither structured by authority nor held together by a tradition. So I think I'll end with the idea that education is the moment at which we have to kind of make some kind of a decision. Education is the point at which we decide we love the world enough to take responsibility for it again. And I think maybe we understand now a second meaning or a second shade to, this, to these words. Education is the point at which we have to decide. Education forces on us a certain kind of decision. Um, do we love the world or do we give in to the process of decay? In politics, of course, we can rebel against authority, we can have revolutions and all the rest of it, and that's part and parcel of the politics. Um, in social life, too, there might be kind of sexual revolutions and all the rest of it. But in education, we lose not just the whole enterprise of education um, if we overturn the past, but we also lose the possibility of the future in general. So I'll, I'll end with one final quote from Aaron. Edu uh, and this is where she explains that education is not just the point at which we decide we love the world enough to take responsibility for it, but also, and I quote, it's where we decide whether we love our children enough not to expel them from our world and leave them to their own devices, nor to strike from their hands 
the chance of undertaking something new, something unforeseen by us, but to prepare them in advance for the task of renewing a common world. Thank you.